All right, so this is a bit of shifting gears. Less hardware, more software. Well, entirely software. Um, yeah, as uh, was said, it's about a compiler called Nama. And before I start, who of you has heard of Nama? Right, that's good. Who of you has used Nama before? Okay, that's good. Cool. Right, because I have uh, some introduction, and I could do this quicker, but then I don't. Right. Okay, so Nama is um, basically a Python package which is used to just-in-time compile Python code. And if you ever use uh, Python for some intensive work, you know how worthwhile this is, and I'm going to show this to you in a bit. Um, the, cool is that you, uh, the cool thing is that you don't need a dedicated compilation step, so everything is done um, with the, <coughs> the interface number of this. And you don't even need to like, define bindings, which is, which is something you would need to do in Cyclone or something. Uh, so you, you can accelerate your Python code quite quite easily, and Namba at the back end uses LLVM uh, for that. So what you probably all know by now, uh, the Clang back end. Uh, they have an own um, package as well from, from their community called LLVM Lite, uh, which is basically a lightweight bindings from Python to LLVM. Um, Namba is fully NumPy aware, so NumPy is this set of algorithms and data types which you usually use when you do some computations in Python. And uh, Numba has backends for different CPU uh, machines for um, doing um, parallel processing on the CPU with OpenMP and TBB and can also target GPUs. And I'm going to show you an example of all of this in a bit. It's uh, basically open source software developed in the open on GitHub, but uh, yeah, I guess the main sponsoring and also the main um, uh, main contributions come from Anaconda, uh, or uh, the, the, these are the guys from Continuum Analytics, which do a lot for performant Python code out there. Uh, the architectures supported are Linux, Windows, and Mac OS, and uh, Linux uh, has all uh, three large um, uh, flavors out, out there, so it's x86, it's uh, PowerPC, and it's ARM. And the backend for PowerPC was, uh, yeah, it's, it's basically a uh, one and a half year old uh, was supported beforehand, but yeah, everything re relies basically on LLVM and how well the, uh, the bindings to LLVM are implemented. Um, usually, you work with Numba by using decorators. Uh, so let's say we have an example um, Python function which just reduces all um, elements of an array into an uh, into a value and returns this value. You would uh, use Numba in form of this decorator, so this add thing which you plug in before a function, and this itself now is a function which takes a function as an argument, uh, nice Python stuff, uh, and then it will compile this reduce function and uh, replace it with the compile function. So it's really, really easy to just try to import number, number JIT, and then it's JIT. Yeah. Uh, you can be, uh, this can be also plugged into other routines, so uh, the cool thing here is that it's quite close to the definition, so you directly know that it's going to be jitted, but sometimes you use um, other packages and you have no way to modify these, then you just um, can use uh, the JIT decorator also directly, because this is actually what's done here. So the function reduce is a function to the JIT function. Okay, so um, the way to use number is by this JIT deco uh, decorator, and there is options which can go to that. So there is a no Python true, um, where you can enable no Python mode, uh, which gives you the best performance. So that's what you should strive for, um, because it will disable the Python interpreter for the uh, for the digital uh, function entirely. Sometimes that's not possible because there is um, lots of um, context and lots of objects being used. Then you need to say no Python equals uh, false. Uh, then number switches to something called object mode. And it will compile only the bits of this uh, Python function which it actually can compile. It, will, it might still give you some benefit, but it's not the full C backend benefit. Um, there is an option called parallel equals true, which you can give to JIT, which will enable automatic parallelization. Um, this works uh, sometimes better, sometimes worse. We are going to see this in an example. Uh, then there is an add vectorize uh, decorator, which will create a vectorized function, relying on what uh, LLVM does in the background. Um, and if you know NumPy, this will generate a NumPy u fund. There is a generalized u fund, um, which does not have scalars as inputs, but uh, 
arrays, um, like NumPy arrays, um, and with that you can basically create your own NumPy functions, which is cool. So when you use uh, numpy.xenos or numpy.max or something, you can always give it a whole array. And with that you can easily do this in a performant way for uh, NumPy as well. Uh, you can give um, to the digit compiler, uh, either as a string or as data types, a, a signature. Um, and this is sometimes beneficial if you're in HPC like we are. Uh, then you want to make sure that you're actually using the right data types and in Python this is sometimes not so clear because you're very lazy and uh, it also depends on which, uh, on at which position your Python code is um, compiled. So if you don't give it a signature, it needs to uh, infer the type so it's only, be only being compiled in a lazy way when it's, uh, when it's called, this function is called. But if you can give it a, fun, uh, a, a type signature, then there is a mode called eager compilation or it's compiled when it's first read. There is uh, more other stuff, um, like where you can use uh, fast math uh, or uh, define stencils in a, in a special way, but this is beyond the scope of it. Just wanted to mention, as this might be interesting for some. Okay, so I think everything's better with examples, so I'm going to show you all this now again with examples, and I use the stream benchmark, and I like to add some of the uh, number features on top of that. So this is the stream benchmark, there was four of them, actually. Uh, just one where um, a ray is copied to another location, then during the compilation in the scale benchmark, there is a scale-up uh, uh, multiplied on top in the add version, two arrays are added, and then put the, the output put into another array, and then there is uh, basically the last, the triad, then there is addition, but also on the second part there is uh, scale-up multiplied on top. Uh, I test this uh, in our system in Unity called Euron, which is a power-based, um, power-8-based system. Um, yeah, we operate this since a few years uh, quite successfully, and it's, it's a lot of fun to use this. And I'm going to show you the bandwidth now for a 120 uh, million uh, double precision arrays, it's roughly one gigabyte, and yeah, I will give you the best of three of an average of ten and time it with time it, uh, because it's very handy in Python. So this is, uh, if you call the exact um, benchmarks I've uh, shown you before in Python, you are having a very um, low bandwidth, so it's uh, like a tenth of a gigabyte uh, per second, and the distribution is kind of strange. But this is what you get in Python, right? Now let's uh, throw this JIT compiler on it. So the same function as before, I use them here. But then I say JIT compile this and I even give the definition so that the compiler knows uh, what, what is actually the, the content I want, want here. And just with that, I'm uh, increasing my, uh, my bandwidth for this benchmark a hundredfold and slowly uh, go into the rounds where it's actually interesting. All right, so this is JIT. Um, I, uh, because um, I'm going to uh, jump through scales, I put always a uh, log scale from now on into the bottom. Um, now there is this GU vectorize where you can basically create your own NumPy-like functions. Um, and this a question, can my code um, benefit from all the way the JIT compiler exposes then this uh, vectorization strategies to the LLVM, uh, which is underlying there. Um, and the only change basically you need to do in comparison to before is that you have a second string here where you say, what is the calling uh, signature? Right. And when you add this, it's basically very similar, but for some reason, which I don't know, uh, the uh, latter two uh, benchmarks benefit a bit, a bit from this. But in general, it's very similar. Now I want to try out the parallel backend. So if you just add parallel equals true, um, what number can do is it uh, can automatically parallelize common NumPy constructs because they implement these. And people usually so often use those NumPy stru 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 structures. And it can also fuse adjacent parallel op operations to better uh, use the cache. So then this would look like this. But I'm not using NumPy function. So I need to do something else. And there is uh, something before I do, which I want to show is, um, so instead of JIT, I wrote NJIT, which is basically a shortcut to not always write JIT with the no Python true, but just write NJIT. It's a bit short. 
So now instead of um, range, I can use a number thing, uh, sorry, a number thing called uh, p range instead of range. And this will then parallelize this loop. Also very easily, and um, it has different backends for this. It can do this with uh, thread learning blocks, with um, OpenMP, and with a bulk queue, which is the default backend. Um, you can uh, choose the threading layer also during runtime, which or during, yeah, during start time, uh, which is also quite nice. You can easily benchmark things against each other, and there is an environment variable where you can vary the thread. thread. And um, I did this on Neuron, um, which has 20 cores, 8-fold uh, uh, SMT, and uh, put it now here two um, examples up. So there is um, two threads and 10 threads in purple, and with 10, uh, with 10 threads um, in purple, we go close to the 18 gigabytes per second. And just to compare now, so this is um, the final, uh, next to the final example I wanted to show, just, just to compare, this is uh, faring against the C, official C implementation of the screen benchmark. It is basically quite close to, close to this, except for trial, which for some reason is higher than the C benchmark. But this is, uh, I think, very cool to uh, get this kind of performance from a Python code. All right, so but I'm interested in number because it does not only um, target CPUs as a backend, but also GPUs. Um, it can do this for CUDA or the uh, AMD Rockham um, uh, platform. And instead of JIT, you now write CUDA JIT. And then um, your code looks a bit different because like in CUDA, you need to use uh, thread indexes explicitly. You can either do this the um, traditional CUDA way with block index, block film, and threading, or you use this shortcut, which I like already uh, a lot. So you write CUDA.grim, grid. And with that, your code looks basically like that. So if you still have your bounds check, but then you can get your uh, index from the CUDA grid, and then basically the rest is all the same, and also the function signatures here are the same. Again, you don't need to give them, but you can give them to be more explicit. Um, you launch this kernel with a syntax I've never used before in other cases in uh, Python, where you have uh, additional square braces where you say how many uh, blocks and threads you want to launch. Um, you can access other uh, NVIDIA or CUDA features like uh, the CUDA event API, which I use for timing stuff. Uh, you can use shared memory on the device. You can use pinned memory on the CPU. So there is a full, full feature set available, and it's, it works super easily. And in the end, this um, uh, gives the emitted LLVM code to the NVVM uh, compiler, which then translates this to the machine code for the GPU. And with that, you uh, come to very good performances. So this is uh, roughly 510 uh, gigabytes per second. So uh, the, in theory, the um, uh, Pascal P100, which are on uh, the Minsky nodes, can do 720 gigabytes per second. So yeah, this is, uh, this is a theoretical uh, value, but with that, we, we come quite close to that, I think. All right. And this was my uh, quick introduction to number, and now I want to show you what I used this, uh, or how I further studied this. And this is with a tool called TDB HPC. So TDB stands for the Virtual Brain. It's a um, framework for simulating uh, brain dynamics on a large scale. So the dynamical part here is important here. And it uh, uses uh, biologically realistic connectivity metrics between um, different uh, regions of the brain. So it's not a morphologically detailed brain where you have each uh, may have individual cells and synapses, but you have rather large groups of uh, or large parts in the brain which are connected and then analyzed. Um, this is built on top of uh, clinical data and uh, in eventually should help uh, patients with uh, neurological uh, disorders. The, like the, the traditional virtual bank stack is um, a uh, Python um, simulation core which is extended by MATLAB scripts with a web-based visual controller on top, so this is uh, everything but performance. So uh, colleagues of ours uh, used um, their HPC knowledge to uh, write a new version of this virtual brain uh, with some kind of HPC technology uh, to, to get, get some speed up and use uh, the computing resources we have at home. Um, because everything is done in Python there, they also stuck to that. Um, and use some, some levels of code generation, but also use uh, parallel backends like we 
like we just saw with uh, number CPU, uh, they wrote something for uh, the GPU, which I'm going to co compare to now. And then they also made an example in CUDA C, so plain CUDA implementation. Uh, this is how um, this is how the kernel is looking, which I'm going to uh, dive in a bit. So this is a Kuramoto model, which uh, the team, or which a team at Jülich uh, uh, Hackathon worked on. So during this week of hacking, they basically implemented this in C and in um, Number CUDA. Um, they wanted to study this as an example and, and see how the, um, the, the program model features principle, or, or work for them. Um, and the, the patterns, which we're going to see also in a bit, are uh, simple arithmetic, there are some function calls, and especially there is underlying memory accesses, the other in scattering. So I made this a bit larger, but uh, you basically can see that there is a lot of uh, input variables. Then you have uh, some kind of uh, index getting, then you have per thread multiple um, uh, uh, yeah, multiple um, uh, loops, and in there you have some reduction which is happening uh, in a thread. Um, and then in the end, uh, so in this loop, uh, you uh, basically gather your data, then you crunch it a bit, and in the end you distribute it again to other threads. Uh, to, sorry, to, to the global memory. Uh, there is a sinus, sinus call here, which I'm going to look into also. In a bit. So the question now is. How does number CUDA actually fare against playing CUDA C? So I think um, number CUDA is a bit easier to program, but is it as fast? And uh, I'm going to use the TBB HPC uh, tool and some extracted microbenchmarks to, to get closer to this answer. So first, um, to continue with the stream comparison from before, I did not show um, uh, all the details uh, comparing number CUDA against uh, CUDA C. So that's what I want to do. Do now, and also I um, timed everything with the CUDA event API, but also with NV prof. And this is uh, yeah uh, interesting here. So you see the um, four benchmarks as before, but now color uh, coded. You see that um, uh, we have in blue uh, the Python implementation, the Python implementation timed with NV prof in orange, and then the uh, to CUDA implementation. And basically, uh, at a first glance, or uh, Bird's eye view, they are very, very much the same. And the only overhead you can see here, and that's uh, when I use the uh, CUDA event API from Python to time this stuff. So there is some overhead uh, just by, uh, by, by using um, the timing which is in, uh, in, in Python, uh, which you just get, and this kind of translates on, on the measured bandwidth. If you use NVPROF, you're always good, and then it turns out that this kernel is actually running as fast as the CUDA kernel. So, good. And then, just to test a simple arithmetic um, problem, I used an uh, A times X plus P kernel, and I used three um, different implementations now. Uh, for once, the uh, number implementation, a CUDA C implementation, and a Kublas call. And I did this also twice, uh, I measured this twice with um, the CUDA event API and VPROF again, like before, but also here I added uh, another level because I could. It was, uh, I tested 32-bit uh, and 64-bit. Um, here it works with templates, here it works with overloaded functions, and here I could even, uh, during runtime, because there is no compile time in Python, uh, just infer the name by putting it into the uh, signature here. So it's a bit hackish, but it works. Um, but also here the, the uh, picture is the same. We get basically the same performance, and again, only a little overhead due to timing through the Python CUDA event API. Um, yeah, we get uh, north of 18 GFLOP, uh, GFLOPs here for the float on the left side. Yeah. All right, so then um, I actually looked at the code, what's, what's, what's happening in uh, the Kuramoto model kernel, and one thing um, I pointed out before was the sinus uh, function. So they use uh, from the math module dot sinus, and um, I thought I'd implement this in a, in a mini-kernel and then also in CUDA C to use also sinus, sinus um, and then time this for uh, 100 million double precision random numbers. And also here, basically, there is a little difference. Um, here now, lower is better because I'm showing you time. Um, and for some reason, the Python implementation, implementation here is uh, really a, a bit uh, faster than the CUDA version. 
Uh, again, there was some overheads, so if you compare those um, from the CUDA event API from Number, uh, I think this comes from type checking. Um, and uh, what you always should remember, I did not want to show this here, is that the first Python implementation takes uh, a lot longer because stuff is jitted at this point. So you should, uh, this is only worthwhile if you run it multiple times. Um, having a look at the PTX code which is generated, in both cases uh, it looks very much the same because it's actually a, uh, I think, Taylor-based Taylor expansion being used here. Uh, and it's long, but it's uh, doing the same thing for CUDA and for Python. All right, so the uh, next step then was for me to look at the whole kernel. So let's compare the whole uh, number kernel versus a CUDA C kernel. Um, interesting bit, now here, it's not important actually, but I thought this nice, is that also for the CUDA C kernel, uh, this one's compiled just in time, but in this case they have a C function, uh, a C file which is imported to Python and then called by an NBCC call from Python. Those are real Python programmers. And uh, this, everything of this is uh, facilitated by this PyCUDA uh, module in case you're interested in this. Um, and then, yeah, it turns out now runtime for the kernel in C is twice as good as for number. So up to now we saw that basic, basically number was always as good as, uh, as C, but in this case it wasn't the case. And yeah, I, I tried to find out what, what's happening here. And uh, I zoom in a bit into the kernel. So yeah, the arithmetic seems to be identical, at least as a first guess, and the external functions like C designers were also um, in basically the same. So where is the time spent in this kernel? And I, Next, uh, study the data access pattern here. So I pointed this out before. So there is this gathering loop which accesses lots and lots of um, places in the global memory and gathers data together. Then it is being reduced into this uh, function here, into this variable here. <coughs> and then in the next uh, lines in the scatter pattern, it's actually then put into other global memory points. So I basically type those two pieces uh, individually. And uh, both for C and for number, turns out that the um, gathering function is uh, the problem. So that's what's, what's the most important part at this level is. So I, I had a look, look at this gathering function. So it takes about 95% of the time. And um, for sure you could now think about it algorithmically. What, what can you do to, um, to this gathering that it might make it better? But actually, uh, before you do this, you should do what I did, I think, because you should have a look if you cannot refactor it. And maybe through that you can see what's, what's, what's happening and can, can improve this. And um, this is basically a reduced version of this um, Kuramoto kernel. And by, by refactoring, um, I um, put in temporary uh, arrays, so I removed basically global memory writes. Uh, this would be uh, here an example for that. Oh, sorry. Um, then, um, I had a look what uh, is actually um, constant throughout the uh, loop trips and extract to those to the highest possible point so that they are not computed um, often, right? So that would be an example here. And then um, I refactored this a lot, uh, removed uh, or extracted the middle parts, and by that you start seeing that there is actually more which can be extracted from this inner loop to the outside, for instance, this theta variable here. So this uh, was the third, third part. And then timing those things, so here is the C as a reference, here is the initial number, and then there were three um, optimization steps, or the refactoring steps I described to you. Um, you. Just by doing this, so no algorithmic changes, you could achieve a performance which is uh, only 7% worse than C. And this, I think, is, uh, is quite a good basis now to hopefully at some point also get away uh, um, or uh, to, to get back the 7% or you don't because programming Python is much easier so maybe that's just the overhead you, you are fine with have, but as a scientist you might want to invest the time in other things. Alright, so uh, just before I conclude, some lessons learned. I thought maybe some of you are now eager to use number as well and want to hear some tips uh, I can give you. So um, I think uh, timing from inside Python does, has, does have some overhead. I found the least overhead was this CUDA events API. Um, but um, yeah, 
gen in general, uh, you, you can use time it for timing stuff in, in Python very very easily, so it's really a pleasure to use this, but uh, yeah, it has a lot of overhead. Um, if you don't use um, JIT signatures like this, then sometimes it's a bit dangerous that you run with the wrong data type, and this is especially important on GPUs, where for 64-bit you just have half the performance for 32-bit. But in Python, usually you don't program with types, you just write, uh, I don't know, give me some, some, some random numbers, I don't care about the position, and then you end up with double position numbers, and then, yeah, this, I think this happens in Python much faster than in, in C. Um, I, uh, had, I encountered a problem where uh, I redefined, or in the, in the code, um, a variable was redefined. So first, uh, a was an int, and then in the next line, a was a float. Um, this Python, you do this kind of stuff, but uh, for a number, this really makes things very, very bad. Um, one bit is about data alignment, so um, number will generate uh, these kind of um, uh, will we, we generate uh, alignment patterns for uh, to match data which comes out of Python to C, and if it actually made as well, but when I added the signature, it um, didn't use C alignment and it did not use float alignment, uh, uh, Fortran alignment, but it used an A alignment, and this made things then very slow. So the easiest way to fix this was this. This was a classical example of the programmer tr trying to do better, but actually the compiler did very well already. Um, if you want to have a look at the, um, the uh, machine code which is generated by, um, or the, the, the assembly which is generated by um, number, there is either a way to use an environment variable to dump this, or even better to use from Python uh, the function column or spec types, because then you get also annotations in line, and it's very, very useful. Um, and if you are generally interested, if your number um, uh, installation works, there is an executable number, and you can give it minus s for summary, I think, and then it will tell you if it found Kublas, if it found Kudat, or if it found Rocker, and, and this kind of stuff. All right, so to conclude, I, I hope uh, I showed you that uh, Py uh, number can accelerate Python code uh, using this JIT compilation, and that um, it does so quite well. It uh, targets different things. Uh, it's a serial CPU, parallel uh, CPU, but also different kinds of GPUs. Uh, I use TDB HPC as an example to dig into the performance differences uh, with micro benchmarks and then individual part benchmarks. And but in the end, it matches the CUDA C performance at, at, at large. And uh, but you need some refactoring because the programming style in Python is just not the programming style you do in C. And that's it. Thanks.